Hello everyone, today's video is all about capital gains tax, specifically the availability of entrepreneur's relief. So entrepreneur's relief, or as it's recently been uh, changed, it's now called business asset disposal relief, but it's been widely known as entrepreneur's relief for over a decade, is when you sell certain assets, you only get to pay a lower amount of capital gains tax. So that lower amount is 10%. Now, for many years, it was 10% on a uh, cumulative 10 million pot. So the first 10 million of gains that you accrued, you'd pay 10%. Anything over that goes back to the normal CGT rate, which is 20%. Now, the budget of 2020 changed that 10 million limit, brought it right down to a million. But even so, sales of anything up to a million pounds, you still want to try and secure that 10% rate of capital gains tax and not having to pay double the tax, which is 20% if you fall foul of the rules. So let's just dive into some of these rules, particularly a recent court case which explored this. So on the face of it, the rules say for shares, if it's your company, you're the owner manager of a, of a, of a SME business and you sell shares in the company, you can qualify for entrepreneur's relief on the sale of those shares if you own at least 5% of the ordinary share capital and you've held the shares for a certain period of time. Uh, it's two years. It used to be a year, now it's two years. But in essential, essentially, that is it. 5% and how long you've, ha you've held them. And if you meet those criteria, you get your 10% tax instead of 20%. Seems easy enough, but the devil is in the detail. So this particular court case examined exactly what it means when we talk about ordinary share capital. So this guy, uh, he had a... Uh, well, he had a minority shareholding to begin with. So specifically, he had a combination of ordinary shares, ordinary B shares, and what we call preference shares. So when you look at all of the shares in issue in the company, including all of those, he had 6% of the overall shares. Okay, so on the face of it, you think he should qualify for the entrepreneur's relief because that is in excess of the 5% benchmark. But when you exclude the preference shares, he only had 4% of the total shares. Now, um, HMRC challenged his claim for entrepreneur's relief and said that you shouldn't be including the preference shares. So what do the actual rules say? So the rules say that the entrepreneur's relief applies to any kind of share capital, no matter how you label it, as long as it doesn't relate to fixed amounts of dividend. So if there is a type of shares that you have which give rise to a fixed level of dividend, that is excluded in working out whether or not you have 5% of the shares. So what this guy actually had, he had what's known as uh, fixed cumulative preferential shares with a 10% per annum coupon. So these um, preference shares were, in HMRC's opinion, deemed to be a fixed rate of return. This 10% is a fixed rate. And hence, they denied him the entrepreneur's relief because when you take those out of the total number of shares, it brought him from above 5% to below 5%. So when the courts looked at this, they said that what you have to do is look at not the payment history, but what the fundamental constitution of the company says. Even no matter what you've accrued for in the accounts, look at the so-called articles of association that every company has and see what exactly uh, it says about the share class. So these preference dividends were based on um, amounts that hadn't been paid in the past. That was one of the, the things that they were based on. So compounded preference dividends. And they, essentially, the first tier tribunal, the courts, had a look at this and they said, 
Okay. Um, these aren't a fixed rate because one of the um, parameters for paying out these preference dividends was all to do with the level of the company's distributable reserves and what it had and hadn't paid out. So the first tier tribunal in the courts sided with the taxpayer and said the HMRC was wrong and this particular type of preference share was not akin to a fixed rate um, uh, type of share. It was more um, in tune with an ordinary share which would have qualified for entrepreneurs relief. And so they sided with the taxpayer. HMRC appealed and the case went before the upper tier tribunal. And the upper tier tribunal basically sided with the uh, first tier tribunal, confirmed their finding and said that these uh, fixed cumulative preference dividends were not were not um, uh, fixed in the sense that they negated being part of the ordinary shares for entrepreneurs relief. And, and they gave an interesting um, some guidance on this. Uh, which they said, the upper, upper court said, a fixed rate is a relationship between two variables. So if you have these types of shares, which paid out dividends of X, depending on Y, that would have been a fixed rate. So X percent, depending on that, that would have been fixed. That would have negated the entrepreneur's relief. However, these particular preference shares were more complicated and there was more than two variables. It wasn't just X depending on Y, it was X depending on Y if Z happened and everything else. There was there was more than two variables in calculating how much dividends would have been paid out on these preference shares. And hence, because there was more than two variables, that meant they weren't deemed to be fixed within the context of the legislation. And the guy um, got his, his entrepreneur's relief because the upper courts agreed with the lower courts and dismissed HMRC's appeal. So do be careful on structuring uh, shares in companies that you, you may have a minority shareholding. You may think that you're OK, that you qualify for your entrepreneur's relief because you have more than 5%. But it's all about the type of shares. Is, have you got some ordinary shares, some alphabet shares, some preference shares, like in this case? Because it could have quite easily been the case that these fixed rate preference shares which were deemed ultimately not to be fixed, could have been <laughs> judged to be fixed had the constitution of the company been written differently, had the articles of association been crafted in a way that hadn't included compounding and it just said it was going to be a percentage of this based on that, you know, the so-called two variables, then you would, it wouldn't have qualified for the, the shares um, that give rise to entrepreneurs relief. So the devil is in the detail. So if you're a business owner, or even if you're not a majority shareholder, if you've got shares, minority shareholding in a company, and you think entrepreneurs relief will apply because you think you've got more than 5%, do you really have more than 5%? Have a look closely of the actual makeup of those shares that you hold, particularly around things like preference shares, anything that's a bit quirky, that's not run of the mill, look, this is ordinary shares uh, in the company, anything a little bit um, outside the box, you may have shareholdings of that. And that could be the reason to either trip you over or trip you under the 5% threshold, hence entrepreneurs relief, either given or denied. And it makes a big difference because with the standard rates of capital gains tax being 20%, that could be double the tax. So in this particular court case, the guy, he made a gain of about 7 million. So the tax at stake on this was about 700 grand. Uh, he paid 700,000 in tax instead of 1.4 million, which HMRC said he should. So do have a think about shares that you have in companies and whether or not they will qualify for entrepreneurs relief. Don't just assume that they do. It's all about the constitution of what is in the articles of association of the company, as opposed to how historically you may have paid out on those shares. Okay, so that's just a overview of entrepreneurs relief on shares in uh, trading companies and what to look out for in those shares. If you like this video, please do subscribe right there and I will see you soon.